dear ones, it's time yet again for the Pulp Raycon Tour and The Swordsman of Mars by Otis Edelbert Klein. I am your reader as usual, Carmel. And I am very happy that Otis Edelbert Klein has got this in the public domain. So we're about halfway through the book. Um, there's been a lot of adventure so far. If you like it, clap your hands. Chapter 14. The group of slaves was ushered into a large building and set to the task of filling and sealing the small files of fire powder. Here the laborers were seated at long benches, above which were suspended large hoppers of the powder. This was conveyed down to them by means of tubes with small valves at the bottom, which could be opened or closed by the operator as the files were filled. Stoppers of red, resilient material like that which formed the suits of the guards were pressed into the bottles, then held for a moment against hot plates, the heat melting them down and sealing them hermetically. The labor in this department was the lightest of any in the Beridium pit, yet it was also the most dreaded of all, as the air was constantly filled with the searing powder which attacked skin and lungs alike. With a sickening apprehension of the fate in store for him, Thorne gradually saw his own skin turning yellow from contact with the fumes and powder in the air and despite the utmost watchfulness, he was unable to avoid burning his fingers and the backs of his hands by spilling on them small quantities of powder which sifted down from the none-too-efficient valve. When night came, the slaves were herded into a great communal building, the only furniture in which consisted of heating globes. Here, a coarse porridge was doled out to them. They were given water to drink. In this building, the air was somewhat freer from dust and fumes than outside, and therefore offered some slight relief to Thorn and the other newcomers whose lungs and skins had not, as yet, been badly seared. After eating their rations, the slaves flung themselves down on the hard floor around the heating globes, many to fall asleep from utter exhaustion. Thorn was about to fling himself down, to, like the others, when he saw sprawled on the floor at his feet, a sleeping figure that somehow seemed familiar. The skin was yellow and mottled with many burns, yet he could not mistake Yerl Du, Jen of the Takor Free Swordsman. Stooping, the Earthman shook his friend. Yerl Du's red-rimmed eyes blinked open, an angry snarl died in his throat. A sudden recognition came to him. He sat up, abruptly, and saluted. I shield my eyes, my lord. I did not dream of seeing you here, and at first I did not recognize you with that yellow cast to your skin. You seem to have acquired considerable color yourself, old friend. How long have you been here? The seven judges sentenced me the day you were taken before the Dixtar, Yerldu told him. The trial was a farce. There was no witness, and no evidence was produced against me except a letter from Selhan. Thorn made Yerl Du and the silvery-haired Levry Thommel acquainted, and for a time they conversed. Then the beridium globes which lighted the building were hooded, and they composed themselves for sleep. It seemed, however, that he had scarcely fallen asleep when a small beridium hand torch was flashed in his face, awakening him, and a guard prodded him with a foot. "'Are you Sheb Takor? the fellow asked in a hoarse whisper. "'I am,' Thorn replied. "'Where is he who is called Yerl Du? He sleeps here beside me. "'It seems you two have a powerful friend at Dukor. "'My superior officer has ordered me to assist you hence. "'Awaken Yerl Du and follow me.' The guard hooded his torch as Thorn shook Yerldu awake and explained the situation to him. Then he thought of Levry Thommel. A touch awakened the old man. Come with me, Thorn whispered. It may be that we can escape. Then he called to the guard. Ready. The fellow opened the slide of his torch only wide enough to enable him to make his way among the sleeping slaves who sprawled on the floor. Then he started towards the nearest doorway 
closely followed by Thorn, Yerldu, and Levry Thommel. Once outside the building, the guard hooded his torch, and they made their way by the light of the nearer moon, which was dropping swiftly toward the eastern horizon. They presently came to a small guardhouse near the rim of the pit. Their conductor entered and motioned them to follow. Thorn marched in first, and found himself in the presence of an officer who sat at the edge of a swinging divan. The officer looked up sharply. "'What's this, Henderson? You have brought three of them!' The guard seemed dumbfounded. "'I, I, I only wakened Sheb Takor and told him to bring your due. Thorn hastened to explain. "'I am Sheb Takor. These are my friends, Yerl Du and Levry Thommel. It is my desire that both accompany me. I was only ordered to assist two, yourself and Yerl Du, said the officer. Levry Thommel goes back. If he goes back, then I go with him, said Thorn. You refuse escape when it is offered to you? I decline to attempt it without my friend. More fool you, growled the officer. Yet I have my orders to assist you, and I suppose this doddering old derelict must go with you. He arose, and stepping into another room brought two bundles of warm clothing and two weapons. One bundle of each he handed to Thorn, and the like to Yerl Du, but Thorn instantly passed his bundles to Levry Thommel. The officer glared for a moment, but checked himself and went into the next room for more clothing and weapons, which he thrust into the hands of Thorn with ill grace. "'You win,' he said angrily. "'But this old wreck you persist in taking with you will yet cause your undoing.' Swiftly the three men donned their clothing, and belted sword, mace, and dagger about them. In addition to these, each was provided with a bundle of javelins in a quiver that hung by a strap across one shoulder— as soon as the nearer moon sets, said the officer, and before the farther rises, you will have time to make your way in the dark up the side of the pit. The rim is guarded, but one guard has orders to pass you. The guard is stationed directly above this building. When you have passed the guard, you will proceed out into the desert until you have passed five outcropping rocks, the northern base of the sixth, which you will recognize because it leans as if it were about to fall to the ground, you will find supplies left there by your friends, because they would have been awkward for you to carry up the side of the pit. Who are these friends who have been so thoughtful? asked Thorn. I only know that these orders came down to me from my superiors, and they must have had them from someone high in the councils of the Kamud. So swiftly did the nearer moon move across the sky that only a short time elapsed ere it dropped below the eastern horizon. Then the three men set out. Overhead, the stars were blazing jewels of white, red, pale blue, and yellow in the sky of jet. Though their combined radiance was too feeble to light the path of the three fugitives, they were still of service, for their line of disappearance marked the rim of the pit and one constellation which Thorn fixed in his mind served as a guide to the point, directly above the house they had just quitted, where they expected to find a friendly guard. Moving with great caution in order not to start a landslide on that steeply sloping bank, they began the ascent. It was a long, difficult climb, and they had scarcely reached the summit when the farther moon rose in the east to the point where the nearer moon had vanished a short time before. Its light was more dim than that of the nearer and larger orb, but bright enough to reveal them to a tall guard who stood there looking out over the pit. Instantly he raised a javelin and advanced threateningly. "'Who are you?' he demanded. "'Sheb Takor and friends.' The guard stared at him suspiciously. I can pass two, but the third must go back. That order was changed. You will pass three or none, Thorn told him. We are going on at once. Raise an alarm now and we will kill you. Raise it later, and there is one high in the councils of the Kamud who will see that you are condemned to the powder room. I crave pardon, Sheb Takorjen. He said humbly, 
pass, and may Deza guard you. And so the three now clambered over the wall, dropped to the other side, and marched out into the desert, free men. Carefully now, they counted the outcropping stones of which the officer had told them. They had passed the fifth at a considerable distance from the pit, and were just coming into the sixth when a half-dozen warriors suddenly broke from a nearby clump of conifers and charged towards them, hurling a cloud of javelins. Thorn shouted a warning to his companions, both of whom were able to dodge the barbed weapons. He called to his two friends to support him on his right and his left, then dashed straight at the advancing warriors. There was another exchange of javelins in which the skilled Ural Du transfixed an enemy, cutting an attacking party down to five. Both sides expended their store of javelins at about the same time. Then swords and daggers were drawn, and the hand-to-hand -hand fighting began. Thorne engaged the blade of the leader of the band, and was instantly beset by another warrior on the fellow's right. Over at his left, Yerl Du fought alone. Levry Thommel, on his right, was attacked by the remaining two, and showing amazing skill with sword and dagger. For a time there was only the clash of steel on steel, and an occasional grunt from one of the wounded contestants. Then Thorn thrust the leader of the band through the throat. With his chief opponent out of the way, it was but child's play for him to quickly dispose of the other. Then, seeing that Yerl Du was getting the best of his assailant, he dashed to the assistance of Levry Thommel. The old man still stood his ground, apparently unhurt, as Thorn came in to engage one of his opponents. A clumsy fencer, the fellow quickly succumbed. At the same instant, Levry Thommel ran his antagonist through the heart. Turning, Thorn saw Yerl Dew coming towards him, cleaning his blade with a bit of fabric cut from the cloak of his fallen adversary. A glorious victory, my lord. Six enemies stretched out on the sand, and we three still live. It was well fought, agreed Thorn. But who could these men be, and how came they to be waiting here for us? I recognized the last fellow I killed, said Yerldu. He was a henchman of Selhan. The spies of the deputy evidently discovered the plot to release us, and he posted these assassins here for the purpose of ambushing us. He expected but two, and we were three, enough to defeat his cutthroats and upset his scheme. That is true, agreed Thorn. He turned to Levry Thommel. It is you, my friend, who turned the tide. But for you, Yerl Du and I would now be stark on the sand in the place of these six assailants. Until I am able to express my appreciation more fittingly, permit me to merely thank you. It is I who owe you a lasting debt of gratitude, protested the old man. But for you I would be down there in the pit, doomed to a lingering death. As it is, I... I... Suddenly he swayed and pitched forward on his face. Alarmed, Thorn sprang to his side, and turning him over, asked, "'What is it, my friend? Are you ill?' "'Ill and to death,' the old fellow replied. "'I was wounded early in the engagement and have been bleeding freely since. "'It is the end I would have chosen. "'Farewell, my comrades.' "'Hastily, Thorn undid his cloak, exposing the wound just above the heart.' For a moment he held his hand there, but felt no pulsations. Levry Thommel is dead, he solemnly told Yerl Du. He was a brave man, my lord. And now we must look for the laning stone and be gone. If the morning sun finds us near the Beridium pit, we too are dead men. Sadly, silently, they gathered their javelins and moved forward. Presently they came to the leaning stone. It was at the north base of the stone we were supposed to look, said Thorn. Yet there is nothing here. Yerl Du thrust a javelin into the sand. At a depth of about ten inches it encountered an obstruction. Swiftly he dropped to his knees and began scooping out the sand with his cupped hands. 
What will become of these refugees? Will they find a safe place? Will they continue to be pursued by the henchmen of Selhan? Will they lose more friends? Find out next time with The Swordsman of Mars by Otis Adelbert Klein.